Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 uh, FFI Leadership Development Workshop. Uh, we really appreciate you joining the workshop this evening. Uh, I, I've had the opportunity to see all the presentations and it's, it's very impressive. And uh, I'm just so proud and grateful for the presenters for the great job they've done in creating these slide presentations. So you can expect to get a lot of information here this evening. The first uh, FFI Leadership Development Workshop was actually held in July of 2019. And that was held during the FFI Expo in Bozeman, Montana. That workshop was actually a full day uh, and it included 18 presentations uh, from FFI officers, board members, committee chairs, staff, and so forth. Uh, and it actually, each presentation was on a different part of the FFI operation. Uh, and the intent was to present that to a group of people that were leaders or those wanting to become leaders in FFI councils and clubs. Um, we wanted to provide a pervasive reference uh, for all those in attendance uh, so that when the workshop was over, they would have reference material they could go to regarding uh, and learning more about how FFI operates. The 2020 leadership development workshop is a little bit different. Um, but last year, the composite of all of those 18 presentations was formed into a loop, a PowerPoint loop. And that loop is available to you at the FFI website. You can download that free of charge. And so if you need more information about how FFI operates or your club or council, could benefit from that information that's available there to you on the work on the website. Uh, just go to the FFI website, click on education, click on learning center, and that menu will drop down and one item on the menu will be leadership development workshop. And that PowerPoint from 2019 will be located right there. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation for this workshop 2020 will also be available and it'll be in that same location on the FFI website. And while you're on the FFI website, be sure to stop by the membership tab and join FFI as a member to support the incredible influence FFI is having in the sport of fly fishing. The, 2000, the 2020 workshop was developed by asking the FFI Council President's Committee to identify topics that were of genuine interest uh, to them. The council presidents identified many topics and this workshop will feature three of those particular topics. Uh, one topic had a lot of interest in how do we develop and strengthen communication between councils and clubs, a lot of interest in fundraising and in particular hosting an auction, whether it be in person or online and uh, certainly with the recent uh, membership uh, survey that, that was conducted, uh, the creation of the new membership plan and the strategy that's being developed from that. We'll have three presentations. The first one will be uh, by Steve Shalla from the Southwest, Conference, Southwest Council. And he's gonna discuss the club management day that the Southwest Council has been conducting for about 10 years. Uh, it's a day where the uh, council brings all of their 23 clubs together to one location. And uh, for a day long schedule of demonstrations, meetings, discussions, and topics of particular interest to the Southwest Council and all the clubs. They, they sometimes have speakers that will come in and, and participate as well. The event began in 2010 and has proven to be uh, just a tremendous program with countless benefits to the council and the clubs. They meet and share information about club operations, demonstration fly tying in classes, casting speakers, presentations of topics of interest to the clubs. The second presentation this evening will be presented by Rick Haynes. Rick is the vice president of the Texas Council, former president of Fort Worth Fly Fishers and chair of the annual Fort Worth Fly Fisher, Fishers auction. Uh, his, Rick's presentation is 
experience rich. Uh, this man knows about fundraising and how to do an auction. Uh, he's responsible for the administration of the highly successful Fort Worth Fly Fishers annual auction. And during the pandemic, Rick has actually hosted two uh, virtual auctions uh, that were also highly successful. Third presentation will be by Barry Webster, FFI board member, chair of the membership committee, and Kate Richardson, FFI staff membership committee liaison. Uh, following the membership survey, Kate gathered the survey data and began to form a membership plan and strategy. And this plan has been developed now by Patrick Berry, Rhonda Sellers, Barry, Kate, and the membership committee. So with that, we'll begin with the first presentation uh, by Steve Schaller. And I'll stop sharing and okay. spotlight Steve. There you go, Steve. Good. Good. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, we uh, um, appreciate the invitation uh, to show what we've been doing with Club Management Day. And I uh, hope I get through this without any uh, tribulations. So we'll start it off. Uh, one of the things about FFI is that it was originally conceived as a hybrid organization. This means that it was a, a group of fishing clubs getting together. Uh, part of it was a social uh, forum that they could get and talk about things like fly tying and casting and learning new fly fishing techniques. It was very loose. Um, there was a grassroots conservation uh, effort, both on local effort, on a local basis and also with regional and national issues. So the fact that we have affiliate clubs, we have charter clubs, we're covering a lot of different areas dealing with fly fishing. Um, this is the hybrid nature that uh, FFI has and some consider it the greatest strength of the organization and it's also considered one of its greatest weaknesses. Let me see if I can find here. There we go. So within the Southwest Council, uh, we lost one club, so we're now down to 22. But of that, it's made up of four charter clubs and 18 affiliate clubs, and we have a total of 653 members. If you look at just the membership, probably 90% of those members uh, belong to affiliate clubs. Now, if we look at the FFI as a whole, there's 264 clubs, 77 are charter, 187 are affiliate, and there's 11,000, almost 11,700 members uh, within FFI. Now we're covering an area from Carson City, Nevada, which is up near Lake Tahoe, all the way down to Las Vegas. And then we're covering most of Southern California from San Luis Obispo to San Diego. So the bulk of our clubs are within 150 miles of Los Angeles. But uh, Carson City's 400 miles away and Las Vegas is 200 miles away. And uh, a lot of times it's just too far for these folks to get uh, where we have our meetings. So one of the things that we recognize within the different, within the council is that this problem of communication of getting together, um, having meetings, it can sometimes lack in communication and we get this sense of disconnect. Um, again, distance might play a factor in it, but it might also be the organization of how, we, how we're trying to communicate and how successful we are. And if we aren't very successful, there becomes a loss of relevancy with the council towards the clubs or vice versa. There's just an, an inad inadequate amount of contact. Some of the affiliate clubs look at it and they go, you know, uh, let's look at this cost benefit cost analysis. Uh, are we really getting what we uh, pay for when we uh, make our affiliate uh, membership dues? And that becomes then a, a, a club board decision. Now, if you look at the affiliate clubs, only about 20% of uh, the affiliate club membership 
our FFI members. That's true in our council. And from what I've talked with other uh, council presidents, and it's uh, quite often the same thing within theirs too. And then you also have this additional uh, problem of each year you get a whole new group of board members, club uh, uh, officers that are new. They have no idea what's been happening in the past and uh, they've got very little experience. So this is the recognition of the problem that we encountered. Um, we have a, a member on our board, she's been on our board for years, uh, Carol Cotts with a, a project Healing Water. She's also a member of the national board. And then Michael Schweit, who at the time was president back in 2009, they had a conversation about this communication gap. And uh, Carol came from a, uh, uh, when she was, uh, had, had her sons involved in swimming, um, there was a number of swimming clubs that also had communication problems, mainly doing, uh, dealing with uh, rule changes and uh, uh, the best practices for swim workouts. All these different clubs were doing different things. And they found that, hey, if we can get together once a year and compare notes, it can be a benefit to all the clubs. And so she took that same concept to Michael and we thought, yeah, let's do that for our, our council with, with these various clubs and see how it works. So the first thing is getting prepared. And um, what we found is that we need to communicate at least a month before the event, before the club management day with all of the clubs. And so the president and the vice president um, they divide up the duties as far as contacting the various club presidents. And they do that generally on a phone call. We want to get some one-on-one -on -one conversations going. And from those calls, then we, we ask, okay, what do we need to do? What kind of feedback do you have? What kind of ideas uh, pertain to the success and problems of the clubs? So we're getting this feedback from them. And then we, with those calls, we also get a more of a commitment from each club president to approach his board with the same uh, kinds of questions. Okay, we're gonna have an opportunity to get together. Let's make the most of it. What do you find as problems? What, do you, what are we been succeeding? Um, you know, let's, uh, let's get together on that. And so um, what we also, also do is uh, because we kind of want to break this up, it's not just a, a, a large powwow conversation. Uh, we also try to break up that day with a, a, a keynote speaker or a presentation that we'll put together. Now, our board is maybe a little bit on the large size. We've got 19 board members and each of those uh, represent a certain interest. So we'll have conservation, social media, communication, casting, youth, fly time, just a number of areas. And it's those areas then that um, we generally identify as breakout groups for club management day. So we ask each board member that represents that interest to contact the individual within the various clubs that also have that same interest. So for instance, uh, Trout in the Classroom, um, our chair then would contact the Trout in the Classroom uh, leader for each of the clubs. And again, he would do this about a month before the event and get information as what material should be covered, if there are any problems, logistics, concerns, whatever. And then he gets a commitment from that member that they will attend the club management day. Now, as far as speakers go, um, back in 2017, we had Len Zickler, who was the president and CEO of FFI. He gave a presentation on the goals and planning of FFI, and this was a great help to all the various clubs to actually hear from National uh, directly. Uh, so it was a great opportunity for all of us. Uh, last year, I gave a presentation on how to promote a fly fishing club. Um, so you try to put something in there in addition. Now you need plenty of room for the participants. You know, it's with 22 clubs, 
um, if we have five individuals from each club, we're going to have over 100 members. And that it, it never happens that you will actually get 100 or potentially uh, over that, but it's, it's potentially you could. The greatest attendance we had was 75. And that was a good sized group. But you need to have the space uh, to, to have everybody under uh, a roof. Uh, there could be rain. Um, you need some room to uh, break out into different groups. So, you know, you need a room of, in this situation, of about uh, 150 people. And what we do is we have it at a clubhouse on, at a park in Riverside uh, called Deep Creek uh, Fly Fishers. Um, and they have a little kitchen area there. So uh, when the uh, people come in, they've got donuts and coffee and uh, there's restroom there. And then they've got a big deck that faces their, uh, their pond or their lake. And that's an area that we can break out into small groups and uh, um, have these uh, breakout sessions. Um, we generally host the lunch and it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's nothing substantial. Generally it's uh, Subway sandwiches and some chips and some drinks. Uh, we put a, a, a hat out there on the table and uh, usually the clubs come through with enough donations to cover the cost of the lunch. Uh, now this year, we're looking at some COVID restrictions in which we can't have uh, this physical meeting. So what we're looking at right now is having some type of Zoom that will allow us to have breakout rooms within that Zoom. And this is gonna require a moderator. So the next thing we have to do after we've made all these phone calls and contacted these various clubs and their members is we need to create an agenda. And the agenda is gonna come from the feedback that we've got from those phone calls. You know, what issues did the board members find when they canvassed the, the club representatives? How many board members do you think are gonna actually attend? And how many club representatives are gonna be there? From that, then we can establish the number and the type of breakout sessions we'll have. If we don't have huge numbers in any one area, we might combine those. So there might be, uh, communication and social media as one breakout group, or we might have casting and fly time under an education breakout group. So once we make this agenda, we send it back to all the clubs to review again. And from that, we might even uh, induce some additional attendees. Now, when it actually comes for the day, um, we get there about an hour early to set everything up. And generally, as we walk through the door, there's 100 people an hour early themselves. And it's because they love to visit. And uh, it's a lot of promotion, and, uh, but it's a lot of fun getting everything set up. They're having their coffee. They're having their donuts. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of noise going on. Um, we bring in the agendas. They're printed and ready for distribution. Uh, we do have Wi-Fi there, so uh, it's available off the internet if they need it. But we are going to start right on time. Uh, that's really important because uh, uh, if we don't, it's going to be a long day. So the first thing we do is uh, introduce ourselves. Um, I'll, you know, the president will in introduce himself. We'll usually have the entire board on a uh, long table or a number of tables that are set up in a long line. And we actually go down the entire line uh, of our board so that they can introduce themselves. And then if you do have a speaker, then you can have a chance to introduce the speaker too. So we explain community, or the uh, club management day to all the attendees and what it's designed to do to help the club succeed. So the timing is, is that from 10 to 10.30, we make these introductions and the president's comments. Then right at 10.30 to 11.30, breakout groups happen. It's a one-hour one group generally. Now, sometimes these breakout groups can get really involved, and they don't want to stop in an hour. That's okay, because we've got another one-hour lunch in, involved, and a lot of times they'll grab that lunch, that Subway sandwich, go back to their group, and, and continue to discuss issues. But by 12.30, 
uh, we, we definitely have a formal uh, start to either the presentation or the speaker. And then at 1.15, after the speaker or the presentation has been completed, then we'll get a summary from each group. And uh, generally, it's one of our board members that is, is uh, the leader of that group. And they'll give about a two to three minute um, uh, summary of what transpired. Um, at the end of the, uh, of the, the sessions, uh, from about 1.45 to 2 o'clock, We'll get questions and comments and then adjourn. And uh, I can probably tell you that those questions and comments really don't last 15 minutes. They last probably more like 45 minutes. So uh, even though we say we're going to get out there at two, we generally don't get out till three. Now, what we want to do is a follow up. So uh, what we do is uh, we send an email to all the attendees thanking them for their time and their ideas. And we do this the day after their meeting. Uh, it's important to have an immediate follow-up. And then I send a request to all our board members to, that I need a summary back from them uh, indicating what transpired in their group session. And I'd like to get it by the end of the week. Now, this is just uh, some examples of the breakout sum, uh, session summaries. Uh, we lost our, our previous president, Bill Kelly. He passed away of cancer uh, during this last year. Uh, but he was the one that uh, had it in 2019 or no, 2018. And in this situation, then his group, these are his notes. Uh, Lou Riffle from the president of the Santa Barbara Club raised an issue of having a classified ad system on the Southwest Council website um, to sell items from members and reach a greater audience. And then uh, PCC, which is Pasadena Casting Club and the Southern Sierra Fly Fishers, um, they talked about having really good success with bringing in youthful members, particularly through social media using Instagram. Um, and again, many, many of our clubs were we're getting up there kind of long in the tooth and we're looking for ideas of how to get younger members in. One of the things that PCC did was they have a, 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 a evening called Vice on Ice and it's fly tying at a brewery. Um, Chiaki Harami, who is the uh, president of the Southern Sierra Fly Fishers, indicated that they had a thing called Pint Night and it was a local microbrewery in which uh, they would also have um, their meetings and would do some fly time there. Um, and then even uh, John Frazier from Golden State Fly Fishers out of San Diego, they indicated they moved their meeting location to a brewery. And um, this has been a bringing in a whole different set of club members um, and a lot of them being much younger. So, those were some ideas that we had that were passed around at, during the uh, president session. Um, on the conservation session, uh, we had two, two leads on that, Gary Appleby and Debbie Sharpton. Um, and both of them had been spending probably about five years on a Lahotan uh, cutthroat restoration project that we were doing on Silver King Creek. Um, John Burns was looking for projects. FFCOC is Fly Fishers of Orange County. And he was looking for some ideas. Uh, Daryl or Dale suggested uh, that uh, there's a, a chance of doing some monitoring of genetically pure steelhead, um, getting uh, 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 samples and uh, collection permits. Um, and that this might be something we could do on the East Fork of the San Gabriel to tributary. So anyway, these were just the ideas passed around. In fly tying, uh, Steve Fernandez and Dave Boyer uh, were our co-leads in fly tying. Um, again, it, the focus was how do we get younger people into the sport? And uh, Steve brought up the fact that uh, there's a lot of young people looking at YouTube. Um, Rather than joining a club or participating in a club, they're using YouTube to get uh, um, information. And uh, again, I think that probably lends right into why we have a learning center. 
uh, Steve had mentioned that he'd been participating in national conclaves since 1977. And throughout that entire time, he says it really hasn't changed much at all as far as the number of youth involvement. So how do we do this? And uh, one of the things was how do we target these, these uh, youth, or if you want to call it a youth from 30 to 50, I guess we can. Um, but anyway, the, the thought was uh, to get more involvement in uh, social media. Now, Trout in the Classroom was really hitting a dead end back about 10 years ago. Um, a lot of our clubs had chillers that were failing. Uh, we had less and less interest within the school system to uh, uh, get involved. And so Rich Bollinger, who still heads up our Trout in the Classroom, um, uh, chair. He got together with the California Division of uh, Fish and Wildlife and really got them excited. And Fish and Wildlife has taken on to supply all of our clubs with chillers, aquariums, and uh, anything they need to get this thing going. Um, they've s helped set up a training session for all, any of the clubs. And uh, then the clubs get out and they canvas uh, different schools. Um, anyway, this is just, it just morphed into something really big. Uh, my personal club that I belong to, the Sespe Fly Fishers, um, we've got, I think it's, it says nine classrooms, but that was two years ago. I think there's like 18 classrooms now that are involved in this. And uh, Deep Creek was the gold standard. That They had something like 30, 30 classrooms involved. Um, so anyway, this is just goes to show, and this is a function of Southwest Council, that you get the right people involved in a certain interest, and you know who to talk to, we can really move things in a positive, positive way. Um, so this was, the Trout and Classroom's just been a, a big success for us. Now, outings, events, and fairs, uh, Michael Schleit is our, uh, kind of heads that up. Um, he puts the uh, organization into our uh, fly fishing fair and uh, helps organize our riptide rendezvous and our flyby and a number of other outings. So he gets together with all sorts of the clubs and, and how, how do we share club events? So we're putting club events then into our newsletters, uh, the Southwest Council newsletter, all the club events are there. Uh, we're trying to get those implemented into our uh, calendar on our website. And it's important that uh, all of these clubs understand what we're trying to do with the different uh, outings and the fairs and the events, because it's really them that it's, we're, we're trying to increase and promote fly fishing to the general public, and we need their assistance to really do so. Uh, casting has been with Eric Callow. Um, right now, I think we have 55 certified casting instructors, um, but there has been a, a problem with that recently in which we've been losing uh, casting instructors, not gaining. Uh, and we've canvassed our, our clubs. We found that uh, um, intermediate casting clinics are something that they're quite interested in. And we had, I think, an intermediate casting uh, clinic right before this COVID restriction, in which we had a, a, a it was sold out. We had 40, 40 people involved. Um, and it was a two weekend affair. Um, anyway, it worked out really well. Uh, we were going to follow that with the casting challenge clinics. Um, but then we've got uh, held back with COVID. But anyway, um, that's an ongoing thing. And this was the way through Club Management Day of getting that message out. Now, youth with Carl Crawford. Um, Carl's a member of the Pasadena Casting Club. And he's just done some amazing things with youth. Um, Debbie Sharpton, who's our conservation, had directed him to uh, Charles Thomas of Outward Bound. And for the last, I think, five or six years, we've been having outings with about 25 urban kids um, from the Pasadena area out to um, 
uh, Golden Trout Wilderness, and we set them up at a place called Golden Trout Camp. Uh, Snowbee uh, comes with their own a manufacturer here in the U.S. They bring all the rods, so we've got rods for everybody. And we have uh, members from Southwest Council to, to teach fly fishing to all of these kids. And a lot of these kids have never seen, they've never camped before. They've never even seen the snow. Um, so anyway, it's always been just a thrill to see on their face, you know, they'll, they'll hold a, a rod for the first time and within 10, 15 minutes, they'll catch their first golden trout. And uh, it almost seems like you probably got them for life. Now, casting for recovery, um, we have two women involved in that. This has been a very successful program for us. Uh, we set up the different retreats. Uh, they've got one in Lake Arrowhead. Um, they also have one up in Bishop. And we use the, the Southwest Council to help bring in volunteers because they need quite a few working one-on-one -on -one, um, at these retreats. And then on the web and the social media, social media is becoming more and more important. We've got a young college kid right now that's uh, uh, heading up the social media program for us. And we're trying to implement him into our website. Um, uh, anyway, it's, uh, we've, I, we've had, I think over the last year, about a 20 to 30% increase in uh, thumbs up and favorability. Um, on social media, both in Facebook and Instagram. So I wanna just conclude then that Club Management Day, it's, it's a useful meeting for bringing people together and improving club leadership. We've been doing this for the past 10 years. And although affiliate membership remains at 20%, even with club management, we haven't changed that number. It's still 20% but we, our communication with all the clubs has markedly improved. Um, and there's been a, a network between the clubs now that's uh, really strong that we never had 10 years ago. And if we look back at our bylaws, at our mission statement, you know, our mission is to cultivate and advance the art, science, and sport of fly fishing as the most sporting and enjoyable method of angling and the way of fishing most consistent with the preservation and use of game fish resources. To be the voice of organized fly fishing, to promote conservation of natural resources, to facilitate and improve the knowledge of fly fishing, to elevate the standard of integrity, honor, and courtesy of anglers, and to cherish the spirit of fellowship among anglers everywhere. And this is what club management does. So I thank you very much. Steve, thank you so much. That uh, it, it's so impressive how you identified uh, a, a challenge or a problem you had, and you created this program. And to see the benefits to your club year after year after year, you know, starting out uh, with the intent of maybe improving communication between council and clubs, clubs and councils, is a pretty obvious, admirable goal but you mentioned that you've seen an improvement in the communication between clubs. And I, I think that's a particular uh, benefit. Also, you mentioned uh, as you're planning for the, the next club management day, uh, you're planning on a virtual or an online uh, event. Uh, last weekend, I had the pleasure to attend the, the Celebrating Women in Fly Fishing event. Um, and it was all virtual, it was all online. But, and the reason I mention it is that they, they were able to do what you suggested. Uh, they had a place where you could log into this event. And from there, you could go out to a bunch of different rooms. And each room was a different topic, uh, sponsors, vendors, and so forth. But uh, if you'd like some more information on that, I'll be glad to put you in touch with Patty Lucan and Mary Ann Dozer and Corey Berenger. They spearheaded this. And it was a very, very successful event, and they, they managed the Zoom chat room, the Zoom breakout room thing very nicely. But thank you for that presentation, Steve. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do Rick. Uh, oh, 
Okay, Rick, if you'll go ahead and open your uh, screen share, we'll be all set. And while Rick is doing that, a couple, uh, there are a few questions came in, Steve, I, I think was able to answer them. Um, I wanted to mention one question uh, came up. Yes, uh, Steve's presentation as well as Rick's and Kate and Barry's will be available in the Learning Center uh, after the workshop this evening. You'll be able to go there and download those free of charge. Um, okay, we'll go ahead. Okay, Rick, you're all ready to go, my friend. Go ahead. Rick, we don't have sound. You're still muted. There you go. Rick, went, there you go. Very sorry, it went to the top of my screen. I didn't see it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good evening, you guys. Um, uh, this is gonna be uh, the first part of a three-part uh, segment of fundraising and um, so the first part will be tonight and the rest of it will be available uh, if you guys wanna see it. So there are many reasons that a club may need to raise money. <clears throat> they may want to help fund their monthly operating costs or fund their, fin their financial goals in their community, such Rick, as funding. Rick, excuse me. Do you wanna click on the from beginning button up there on the far left at the top and start to, that'll put it into the slideshow format. Well, wait a minute. Sorry. There you go. Right down. down right there. Down a little bit. Be right there. You're right. right on that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I forgot everything we practiced. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're doing fine. You're doing fine. <laughs> so, so I'm starting over. So um, this is the first part uh, of a, of a three-part uh, segment for fundraising. So uh, if you want anything uh, if you want interested in, in the rest of it, uh, we'll be have it on the uh, Learning Center for you guys sometime next week. So um, there are many reasons that a club may need to raise money. They, um, excuse me, they may want to help fund their monthly operations or help fund financial goals to their community, such as funding conservation events, um, donations to their local activities, um, charities, national support groups. My presentation tonight is designed to give insight to the many forms of fundraising methods and the organization planning and execution necessary to achieve those goals. Organizing a fundraiser can be as simple as offering a fishing or general merchandise related item for sale <clears throat> by live auction, silent auction, raffle, club event, venue, or even a a virtual platform. The ultimate would be a full-blown event encompassing a variety of revenue generating methods. All require organization and planning. The level of organization depends on the complexity of the event. The simplest to the most complex event will require part or all of the tasks outlined in this presentation. Tonight's presentation will address the organizational aspects of funding. So, there's a several types of fundraising activities. Auction, live auction at your club, special event venues such as wineries, breweries, distilleries, or any uh, exciting venue that uh, you can think of in your city or area. General raffle could be bucket raffles for um, items from $5 to $10 to $20, and this generates quite a bit of money. This is one of the best fundraisers fundraising parts of the uh, of an auction. Uh, special raffles such as a kayak <clears throat> or special trip. The uh, drawing for that raffle will be held at your club or a special event, depending on how big it is or important. The process calls attention to your club as well as attracts outside participants, thus creating a potential for new membership. Then there's a, a mini raffle. <clears throat> we use this quite a bit early on. Um, this can be a one item prize that may run several, three or four months, depending on the size of your, um, the people participating. And the drawing for that would be held at your club, or if it's a really big item, you can really hype it up and have it at a venue. And then there's a Buy Me Now event. Uh, of course, this is a direct sale of all types of merchandise that you may have for sale. 
Oh, hold it. Sorry. Organization of a fundraiser can be as simple as offering. That's the other way. I think. The wrong way. Yeah. There you go. Here's the most important part: the virtual. Virtual. I'm messing it up. You may want to erase this recording. Um, the, the online-based fundraiser has gained in importance since the COVID-19 uh, era. Uh, there are several ways to present items, such as live, silent, auction, um, and any other scheme you may think of. The length of the event can be a flash sale lasting one or two days, uh, or a time process that may last seven to 10 days. It just depends on uh, how many things are offered and, and the quantity or expanse of your bidders. The bidding methods can vary <clears throat> as um, outlined below. We have, we can bid a, buy, a blind bid. The value of it is stated, um, the bids are solicited and uh, the highest bidder wins. You can have an open bid where the value is stated and the bids are made during the bidding process, but you might just advertise where the bids are and then hopefully that will stimulate some other people to maybe try to outbid the successful bidders at the time. And then um, the bidding would be over uh, at the declared date. <clears throat> this would this one really is an exciting way because now you may think some people are going to wait and uh, they'll wait until the very end and they might, but you still will get some bidding. Uh, if somebody bids high enough in the middle, you may you may end up winning it. And then there's a an open and uh, blind and open bid. It's a hybrid. I won't go into that one. You can do totally blind bid, which would be the winner is determined by um, you don't know the value and you just submit your bid and you hope you win. You may want to um, establish a base for this or maybe even all of the other bid items just so you make sure you get some kind of decent return. You wouldn't want somebody to win a, a fly rod for a dollar. So I think you may want to think about that. Uh, there are many web-based sites to select from. The most basic program to the very complex. Several Several that come into mind are, are Better World. We use, uh, Fort Worth Fly Fishers uses this or has used it. It's a program that is basically free, but it asks for a donation if bidders um, want to uh, donate. Then there's a, a, a outfit called Ticket Printing. And they are a program that covers the whole gamut of auction needs. <clears throat> and there are many companies that do this same thing. They will design and print any tickets you may need They'll handle your bidding process <clears throat> and several other, other functions that may be useful. And uh, I might add that ticket printing is working with FFI to provide these services. And so they're branded and they help brand FFI in, in some of your organization's events. Uh, and please check them out and any other bidding pro uh, program uh, that you may uh, want to and then decide for yourself which is best. So, the first thing, there's several things that um, are, are basic to organizing an auction or a fundraiser. This, this, can, this can happen for uh, all types of fundraising activities. The first thing you need, though, is a venue and or a way that you present your auction or fundraiser. So you need to locate one of these, this, and secure it as soon as possible. This could be a brewery or, or several other thing, uh, items that I have mentioned before. Uh, as soon as you secure that, uh, you need to save the date, and, and it should be maybe four to six months in advance. <clears throat> the auction, uh, the length of the, uh, excuse me, the auction should be held in a month or meeting to that meets your res, your uh, revenue goals. And I can't see my whole thing. And I cannot emphasize enough that you should pay attention to school breaks and local and regional events that make create a major conflict with your event. Events should be on a day to take advantage of maximum club and non-member participation. Auctioneer, you need an auctioneer and uh, as soon as you secure your date and uh, venue, you should get an auctioneer. And a lot of y'all may think that um, you can have an in-house auctioneer and they may do good and, and, they, and they can do good, but I stress you can get an auctioneer for your event at a very reasonable price and it'll pay for itself uh, way over what your in-house person will do. And I've seen it happen. So uh, consider that. Marketing is a very, very important part. 
Um, and so you need to post flyers, articles, pictures of current and past events to generate awareness of the timing and flavor of your event. And all current and other methods <clears throat> of communication should be incorporated in your promotions. A few of the exam examples are place your club and, and event flyers to all local fly shops and big box sporting goods retailers. Uh, place articles in your newsletter, articles in your FFI council newsletters, and post regularly on your social media. And again, uh, I've touched on this before, but the location and the location, date, and timing is very important. And you need to consider this for the selection of your venue to determine the type of fundraising event. And uh, again, several locations to consider are special venue, um, breweries, wineries, um, club, your club, club meeting place, your local church, or someone's local church, civil sites, and virtual. <clears throat> the date of the event should be coordinated again with community events, school breaks, and holidays to maximize your attendance. The time of, of day and or night is also an important consideration. And personally, I believe the best place <clears throat> to have your fundraiser is at a venue that has an exciting theme. For my club, Fort Worth Fly Fishers, the brewery we use created a very successful event. It continues to grow bigger each year and it creates an atmosphere that the members and guests get to know each other a lot better. The next thing we need to consider is registration. <clears throat> registration for the attended events should be set up as soon as possible and advertised on all available communication avenues that you have, um, specifically online. And um, we've used uh, a, a, a program called Eventbrite Ticket, ticket printing does the same thing and many other programs will do that. All you have to really do is put in auction, um, set up auction and, and you'll get tons of them. Be prepared to accept cash, check <clears throat> and charge prior to the event. And it's important to have charge. If you don't have charge, um, you'll probably lose quite a few people because they just won't come up with cash or, or check. And then um, some of, if not all of the online registration programs will accept payment for a small processing fee. And these are the options that initiate pre-registration. And it's important because you need to try to get a handle on um, <clears throat> who's coming and so that, that sets up your meals and, and a lot of things that you need to worry about. The next item is, uh, <clears throat> is donations. Procuring the items for your fundraiser is one of the most important tasks of your uh, of, to raise money. This can be achieved by simply asking your club members to donate, soliciting on a local, regional, or national scale. Solicitation should start at the beginning of the year. Some vendors can be contacted beforehand, but most potential donors will be preoccupied with holiday sales, so not interested in donating, not yet. Some of the donors that you may be of interest for your donation goals are noted below. Call the guides, call all of your guides for guide trips, national known stores, Bass Pro Shop, Cabela's, Orvis, REI, and the like. There's a lot of those big box people. Destination and lodging venues, fly shops and related vendors in your region, or the US, or even adjacent companies, uh, countries. General merchandise from local vendors and, and shops. And this is important because you'll get some general uh, inf uh, merchandise that uh, maybe not be fishing related, but you'll have a lot of people who will come to the event and not interested in anything fishing, but if they have cookies or pictures or just whatever, they may uh, end up and it would generate a little bit of revenue and uh, keep the non-fishing people happy. Uh, food and drink, restaurants, <clears throat> Call the restaurants, call the tasting rooms, call the wineries, distilleries, distributors, anybody in that, um, that group. Uh, and they'll be happy to, to more than likely give you baskets and or even um, gift certificates or gift cards. Um, so don't, don't neglect doing that. A huge 
<clears throat> excuse me, a huge help in procuring fundraising items is the industry partner program, FFI offers our clubs. This program offers good pricing of merchandise in conjunction with vendors, with our vendors and such as Temple Fork, Outfitters, Orvis, and a few others to just name a few. Rick, we have a question. Uh, the question is, what was the website you mentioned? Actually, I think you mentioned a couple websites that you can use to print tickets. Um, there, there's a lot of them, but we're working with, uh, it's called Ticket Printing. And it's, uh, but it's a website that offers all of the, all of the uh, auction related items. So uh, you can get into that. I had a, a treatise on that several months ago and, and am inter, uh, entertaining it. And I will say that um, all of these websites offer their services. And of course they want uh, some cut of your proceeds. So they can go from free to 2.9% up to 8%. So you just need to check that out and see uh, if they're, um, what they offer is, is of value to you at whatever price that they're asking. <clears throat> okay, so then, um, then we've got food and drink. Should your event be <clears throat> in the, should your event have the need for food, drink, food and drink, a system should be developed to assure a clear and concise procurement method. This could be anything from fully catered to happy hour or food trucks. And I've got an asterisk by food trucks because this should, I should emphasize several food trucks as inadequate service can lead to long lines with participants waiting on food rather than attending your event. So pay a lot of attention to that if, if everybody gets hyped up about a food truck. They're, they're last on my list if you wanna really know. <clears throat> Things to do. You got to select a desired service. What are you going to do? Happy hour, food trucks, catered, whatever. Then uh, once you've decided that, select vendors and get three bids. And then uh, there's some volunteers that will be involved in this. And uh, you can do it all yourself, or you can have someone assigned to pick up, somebody assigned to set up, several people to provide service, and a couple of people to break down. So, Having said all of that, the uh, fundraiser is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't see the top of my word. So there are revenue activities uh, for any fundraiser. The complexity of the fundraiser is determined by this section. The financial goals, the venue, the quality and quantity of items offered at the event will incorporate one or all of the following revenue generating methods. These are basically stations that you may have, depending on the size of your event. And it can happen uh, even virtually, it can happen the same way. <clears throat> so you'll have a live auction, you could have a silent auction, you can have table raffles with um, cans that would accept five, 10 and $20 tickets, uh, a card raffle, you can do a tying, a tying con contest. Um, you can have a rod wall, uh, buy me now table, you can do it virtually and you can do any and all of these virtually and then whatever else you may <clears throat> have a special interest to do. So the next thing, and one of the important things, the size and complexity of your event will also determine the size of your volunteer core. I have outlined a complex assignment list in the presentation, uh, which is uh, in the second set that you won't see, but um, to make sure that all areas are covered. This part of the event creates contact with club members who otherwise may not get acquainted with one another. This interaction is good for your club's camaraderie. The key general operational areas of fundraising can be broken down into the following eight main areas. You need an auction director <coughs> or a designated person. You need somebody in charge of finance and revenue, which could be your treasurer. You need a marketing leader, and that could be if you have a director of social media or, or somebody in that area. Uh, you need someone in charge of your solicitors. Uh, general operations, um, this is the basic paperwork and the, and the back of house kind of stuff, and uh, either the chairman or a co-chairman could be assigned to that. Uh, you need someone in charge of assembly of materials. This is uh, also some paperwork stuff going on, um, but mainly uh, 
taking and processing the donations and, and figuring out how to package them to so they're appealing when you put them on the floor to, to be bid on. Food and beverage, someone has to be in charge of that. And uh, venue, <coughs> set up and take down. So those are sort of the important parts uh, of the organization of, of the all of your um, participants. And then it goes from there. Uh, in our club, we had um, <clears throat> probably total throughout the year, we had like 60 volunteers. So um, we, our, our event is rather large and it required a lot of uh, on hands uh, participation because we're, our deadlines and time to set up was really, really tight. <clears throat> The setup and timing is particularly important. If your venue is operating during the day and your event is following that night, you may have a very short time to set up. So careful planning and coordination is key. A few of the setup responsibilities follow. Set up for, set up for the event, you need to start, if you can, two to three hours ahead of time. Uh, you need to set up Area 51, which, which is really the revenue area, and I don't really know why I named it that, but it's a very important area. This is the heart of your event. This is where your pre-registration uh, and payment of registration is taken, um, transactions all during the um, evening, and then you cash out at this place. So you want to set them up first so they can get their electronics put together <clears throat> and uh, troubleshoot any problems they may have. So the sooner they get set up, it's priority to have them number one. Then I've broken it down into just certain crew, uh, crew types. You may have a crew set up to set up your tables and table skirts. Uh, you should have a crew to set up signs at the stations and miscellaneous areas that uh, might require signage. Uh, you'll have a food crew, somebody who sets the tables up, the utensils and, uh, and the food line. And then maybe a crew C that will handle the raffle and silent auction and miscellaneous tables. And then um, there's several areas where there are smaller tables. So like the card raffle, the, the rod wall station and the kayak table will have somebody assigned to that particular table and they will be responsible to set up their own stations. And then uh, uh, live auction tables will be set up by an assistant to the auctioneer and that could be um, maybe the master of ceremonies or somebody like that. And then at the very end, you need to have takedown. And I like to tell all the people who were on these crews that they're responsible to take down the same thing they set up. So that way you've sort of got everything covered and you know, you know that it's getting done. Rick, we have one question uh, regarding the card um, raffle. Okay. Uh, could you explain how people will receive a card and then that translates into a, a, a card drawn during later on to for the winner? Certainly. Okay. So we have a deck of cards and you have a table and we would also like someone to go out into the audience. And what you do, you've got 52 cards and you sell a card for $10 say. So you come up to me and I've got the deck of cards and you can pick any card you want. After the 52 cards have been sold uh, and you, you tear it in half. So you keep half, the other half goes into a drawing bin. And then when that 52 cards, and that's immediate, as soon as that's done, you, you do a drawing. And then if it's the Ace of Spades, you call out the Ace of Spades and whoever's won that has won. And typically we'll put up a rod, a rod and a reel or something like that. So, so it generates $520 every time you do it. And usually we go through two of those in a night. So. It's sort of fun and you're having people walk around and you know, just you're trying to sell the whole time there. Of course, uh, somebody made a comment, I didn't mention this before. And I, so you're at a brewery or someplace like that and you've probably got, um, you, don't, you can't even tear the thing in half because you're maybe holding your drink or something. So um, the person selling the cards will tear it in half for you and give you your half. Um, and it's a lot of fun. That, that's a, a good way to raise some money and keep some action going. Rick, a second question on this area is what is a rod wall? A rod wall is where you may have five or six wall, uh, five or six rods, rods and reels of all different types and makes. Just say um, somebody's donated a sage rod and reel and say TFO, maybe you 
you purchase the club purchases a TFO rod and reel uh, through our partnership program, and somebody else may donate another rod. So depending on how many you have, we I typically like to have about six of them. So then you you display those all horizontally, one on top of the other, and then you put uh, you describe what it is. You may say sage eight eight weight and with a reel so and so reel, and you'll put the value on it, and um, so then you come up and you put in a you buy a twenty dollar ticket, and at the uh, when it's time to draw for the rod wall, then you just have a drawing for it. You have six drawings. If your number is drawn first, you get your pick of any of the six rods. So then the number two guy gets his pick of the second rod, whatever he wants. So at the end of the night, you, if you're the last, you may not get best choice, but you may get the choice you want. But the deal is you get to choose, if you win the first drawing, you, you get to choose off out of six rods all the way down to one. So that's how that works. And that's a that's a pretty, that's a, a really fun kind of thing to do. And it, and it makes quite a bit of money as well. Okay. Thank you. So the last but not least, we have the master of ceremonies. Very important to keep things moving and on schedule. This person, um, his duties or her duties would be to welcome everyone to the event. And you you mentioned this several times throughout the early part of the evening. Uh, at the first part, you also announce when food service is, is ready. And you don't announce it until it's ready because everybody will start lining up. Uh, even if they if they smell the food, they'll start lining up. So um, remind everybody about ticket sales and where they are uh, and announce where the raffles are and um, and also where the silent auction table is and where the rod wall and where the card raffle tables are. And you keep calling attention to this. And, and I mean, you'll see it all when you're there, but you still try to keep reminding them everybody about everything all the time. And you've got a buy me now table and you want to remind about that and, uh, and continual reminding of all of the stations. These are all your revenue stations. This is where you make your money. This is the reason you have your event. The main job throughout the night is to remain, remind, remind everyone of the live auction and its start time. And then at the live auction, the master of ceremonies introduces the auctioneer, gives a brief description of each of the live auction items, and then gives to the auctioneer for him to do his deal. And then also um, probably a little bit after the auction, uh, he would assist in the drawing of the winners of the rod wall. <clears throat> Also announce silent auction is closed, announce when the can raffle is closed, and then at the end, announce event is over and thank everybody for attending and supporting your club. And that's the end, and I wanna thank y'all for attending tonight or today. Um, the organization was just the first part of the fundraiser's presentation. The entire three-part presentation, including planning and execution is available upon request. So that's my story. Rick, thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I would hazard a guess when you started managing the first auction for the Fort Worth Live Fishers, you probably didn't have much of a uh, map or playbook to go by uh, as you started out. So what you presented here is the detail, the guidelines of what you've learned from experience on all the years you've been doing this. Yeah, exactly correct. Um, the club did have, we've had auctions um, for a little bit before I became president. Uh, when, I, in, when I became president, I also helped when I wasn't president. president. I was on the board and, and I helped in the donation part of the deal. And, but then all of a sudden I had a, a, an auction director who told me about a month before the auction that he, is gonna, he was gonna have open heart surgery the next Monday. And all of a sudden I took, had to take over the auction. And there were about two sheets of paper that told you how to do an auction. So by trial and error, mainly error, I <laughs> developed this process and thought I better write all this down because I couldn't remember it from year to year. And then I've sort of been involved in it um, for the last seven years or so. So yeah, it was, there wasn't much, but it's grown and grown as far as just describing what needs to be done. And it does not have to be as involved 
Ours is very involved because it's got a lot of parts to the puzzle. And, um, and up till even today, the, the timing and the setup is key to us because our venue um, is not given to us until six o'clock at night. Um, if we would have had it last year during, right when COVID hit, ours was going to be in uh, some early April. And I had it worked out with the brewery that we were going to sort of co-mingle our events like an hour and a half into theirs and then let them co-mingle into ours. And I thought that was gonna be a huge money maker, but it turned out that we didn't make any money at all. So. <laughs> well, Rick, before, before we get off here, there's uh, just a couple questions. How do you handle the legal aspects of the auction or the fundraiser? Well, we have, a, we have a legal guy on our board. Uh, so I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. I don't know, I need a specific question and I would maybe be able to answer it, but uh, legally, I don't know what that really means. I don't understand the question. Well, it, it, there, there's certain things you have to, to understand about what your state regulations might be with regard to a kayak raffle or those kinds of things. Oh, well, yes, each state, um, Texas has, has a rule about, um, you can have a, a nonprofit fundraiser, you can have two raffles a year. So, and you cannot advertise, in Texas, you can't advertise uh, to anyone other than your membership. So it becomes a, a, a word of mouth thing to your members. And then you can do word of mouth to anybody you know but you cannot advertise uh, via social media or uh, you, can, you can certainly put it in your newsletter, uh, but you can't actively solicit throughout the state or the United States. So other states may have different rules and, and laws, but, um, and I urge you to um, check and make sure that uh, whatever you're doing is, is legal. So we don't do anything illegally. And we, and every time I have a new scheme, I call up our, our um, attorney and he says, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, but usually he says it's not. So, uh, <laughs> so, so that's, that's it. I understand your question now. Thank you. A uh, couple things, Rick. Uh, what is a can raffle? And please explain the kayak table. Okay, the kayak, I'll start with the kayak table. It's simple. We, we just, uh, we usually purchase or have a kayak donated. We, we used to have them donated, but now we have to buy them. But we, we usually buy a kayak for, uh, for wholesale or below wholesale from uh, one of our uh, supporters in the, around the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And, and then we print up a ticket um, and typically it's a $20 ticket. And so we're just having somebody sit there and sell $20 tickets for a kayak raffle. And um, probably later on, if we continue, um, it'll, it might become a destination kind of venue. It, it may be something a little bit more uh, because we're getting more and more people who just um, come off the street so we might be able to generate a lot more tickets if they're going to ticket to, I'm not going to say we're going to Las Vegas, but here's a ticket, three day paid ticket to Las Vegas or something, you know, so, so that's what that would be. The, the can raffle or bucket raffle is where you have uh, items that maybe don't cost more than hundred uh, $200. And so, and, and a lot of them are, are maybe a couple of, uh, trays of, of uh, flies or something like that. So you would put the flies in like a, a five dollar can raffle. So you'd put uh, you put a set of flies in front, and you'd have a can raffle that would accept. In our case, the five dollar tickets are red, and we color code the, the cans so that we don't get people putting yellow car tickets into our red cans. But it still happens. So then at the end of the night. Um, all of these, all of these items, and we have usually two to three hundred items that uh, end up on tables, and they vary from five to ten to twenty dollars. Um, then the um, then we draw out of each can, and then we write down the number on the. And we have a description sheet, and we write down the number, and um, and then have people come and look and see what they've bid on, and then because we don't we don't do that publicly, we just draw it. And then uh, I'll give you an example. We had a $5 can raffle and um, one of our, um, I guess our board members or 
forgot what she, oh, she was a board member. She made some cookies that were in the shape of a fish and we put it in the can raffle section in the $5 can raffle and that made $150. <laughs> so so uh, don't turn your nose up to these little $5 deals because they can make quite a bit of money for you. So you have to determine what those values are and, and just have a gut feel on, I mean, if I'd have put that in the $20 deal, it might've gotten three tickets, you know? So you got to sort of think about that. Okay. And also one other point on the kayak table, Rick, uh, you may have the drawing at the auction, but you actually make it available for people to buy uh, a, a raffle ticket for months ahead of time prior to the actual night that it's going to be drawn. That's correct. We, we start selling that as quickly. That's one of the first things we do. And a couple of years ago, that was part of our auction. Um, but then I decided that it might should be a little longer so we'd have more a longer chance to get $20 out of more people. So, so we sell tickets at our auction. And this is all by word, by just, you can do face to face. We also have an event in Fort Worth called Fly Fest, and uh, we have a booth there, and we sell a lot of tickets at that event. And so then that's why I decided we shouldn't really have it as strictly part of the auction. So then we put that, our auction's usually in April. So then I put that, then we've moved, I won't say I, we've moved that drawing, we can put it in any time, but we moved it to sometime in May at our meeting. And then, uh, so we've got a couple of more months to generate and, and do outside sales. And, and this year, and then this year we did really well because that was our only real thing that anybody could spend money on. So it's a good money maker, I so. Rick, this is excellent information and there's a lot of moving parts in hosting a fundraising event like this. Uh, you gotta have a plan in order to manage it. And uh, you provide a lot of good information to help people create the plan. And that can be at a major level with a full blown event or just some small kinds of raffles during a meeting. Uh, but thank you for sharing that information. And like Rick said, this will be going to the Learning Center, uh, maybe with the, some additional information from Rick as well. But thank you so much. And if you'll close or, or shut your screen, share screen, then uh, Kate and Barry will be able to open theirs. <coughs> okay. Um, did I go out? Well, thought I did. Yeah, uh, but I've lost um, the thumbnails for Barry and Kate. Yeah, I saw them a second ago. That might be something I did. Well, we're looking at Kate's screen. Um, it should be. Yeah, we Yeah, are. that's my screen. Yeah. Well, is Kate can, okay, go right, yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. I just can't, I, I can't, if I, if I don't see your thumbnail, I can't uh, spotlight it. So um, go right ahead, please. That's just fine with me. Um, so we're going to look at our new membership plan, which has been in the works for a while and is pretty exciting. Um, the membership plan is a result of an iterative collaborative effort, and we're currently on the fourth draft of it. Uh, the plan has been reviewed and updated with feedback from FFI staff and numerous FFI committees, and there's still more rounds of review to come. And the first draft of the plan uh, is in, based in part on the results of the FFI membership survey that responsive management conducted for us this spring. I've included a little bit about responsive management on this slide in case you aren't familiar with them. And the resulting 93 page survey report greatly informed um, our membership plan. And the survey is available if you would like to read it or learn more about how it was conducted. The first draft of the plan was also based on research that we as a staff conducted on other conservation organizations by reviewing their websites, joining their organizations, and interviewing their marketing and membership teams. So now let's look a little bit into the substance of the new membership plan. 
And I'm going to highlight a couple of the major themes and takeaways from the survey report that were really helpful in letting us know what direction to take the plan in. So to start, the membership survey showed that 94% of our members are likely to renew. And a goal of this plan is to get that high number even higher. The survey showed us that clubs have been our main avenue of membership recruitment. It also showed us that members' biggest complaint about FFI is a lack of local involvement. Um, clubs are how our members engage with the organization locally. Our own membership data shows that being in a club makes you more likely to renew your FFI membership. There is a percentage of unclubbed FFI members and the more active members we can get to join clubs, the more members we can continue uh, to renew their FFI memberships. So the plan will include a best practices section for club recruitment and retention. <clears throat> Being a member of one of our specialty groups, the Fly Tying Group, Guides and Outfitters Association, Casting Instructor or Women Connect, also make you more likely to renew your FFI membership. Fly Tying and Women Connect are particularly accessible groups. The membership plan will address methods to help encourage members to join groups as well as clubs, but we need your help to further develop this process. So please reach out to your membership VPs if you have any ideas. We'd really, really appreciate that. Um, Non-members are most likely to have heard about FFI through the internet. Working on internet marketing strategies to generate leads would help target the avenue non-members are most likely to hear about FFI through. This is an element of the plan that we've already started on and we're excited to see the results. The survey showed us just how much our members love Fly Fisher Magazine as both a member benefit and a recruitment tool. Um, it's important to know our strengths and our magazine is absolutely one of them and we plan to utilize it. The survey showed us that people were attracted to FFI by the educational materials offered and that members really enjoy them. So FFI will focus on marketing the learning center to non-members and helping members use it more effectively. FFI's, <coughs> sorry, FFI's conservation and habitat work was polled as the third leading reason that members joined FFI, the second most liked thing about FFI, and the second most important type of service and program provided by FFI. However, on a zero to 10 scale, only 50% of members rated our impact above the midpoint. We need to tell our conservation story better. FF5's members were attracted to our conservation mission and are passionate about conservation work, but they don't feel like we are doing the best we can to support it. We don't have to put twice as much money into conservation. We just have to talk about what we are already doing twice as well. Kate, we have a question, uh, I think yeah. on the preceding slide. Uh, do you have data or percentage that you can tell a percentage of how much more likely it is to retain a member uh, if they're with a club versus retaining a person that's a member at large? Um, yeah, and we calculated that data by going through our inactive members and seeing what percentage of inactive members are in a club versus what percentage of our active members are in a club, and there was a difference. Okay. And second part is, do you have retention percentage data on charter versus affiliate? We do not at this time. Um, our new member database is gonna differentiate the club types um, in a way that we can actually pull out of the system. So we're hoping to gather that data soon. Thank you. Um, so the second leading reason that people joined FFI was to support the sport slash heritage, but again, they did not rate our impact very highly. Our members are interested in preserving the heritage of fly fishing, but they aren't sure what we are doing for the sport today. So like with conservation, FFI National will work on better telling our story. 
Um, the survey showed us that member benefits are somewhat important to members and that offering more discounts closely followed by just communicating benefits that we already offer more clearly would help satisfy that member need. So we'll make, we were gonna work on making that information more accessible. And then with a look at the survey results themselves, the people who responded to our membership survey are very reflective of our current membership base. And therefore the survey responses don't tell us what a more age, gender and racially diverse member base would want out of FFI. So the membership plan will include methods for targeting a wider audience base and social media and influential ambassadors are key for that. Um, so now let's look at an update on the membership plan process, where we are right now and what's to come. We have a new membership database called Your Membership. It's very exciting, it has a ton of new features. Some of those features are available right now and some are gonna roll out over time. Right now you have access to an expanded profile with fishing related questions that'll help us better know and serve our community. You can also update your photo, very cool. And you can find your membership card online for easy access. Soon you're gonna receive a mass communication outlining how to renew, update your profile and view your membership card. So look out for that. And Kate, that your membership is, is now, part of that is actually on the website right now. Is that right? Yeah, as of today. That's exciting. Yeah, it was a long time coming. Um, this leadership and development presentation is also a really great opportunity for us to share this plan and process more widely. And this presentation will serve as one of the first resources that leaders within FFI can access and use to reference the plan. And this presentation will be accessible online after tonight. Uh, this presentation is also accompanied by a document outlining immediate tactics from the membership plan that councils can employ right now, along with resources to help them execute those steps. Um, that should be an incredible uh, tool. And then this is the really big one. Over time, an iterative handbook for the membership plan will grow and live on our website as a benefit available only for our members and it'll reflect best practices shared by councils and clubs, as well as accompanying resources to help implement them. If you look through it and your best idea isn't in the handbook, please send it in and we will add it. We hope to develop and strengthen the handbook as we learn more and face new challenges like tackling membership recruitment and retention during a pandemic. Um, it, this needs to be a living document. So let us know if there's something you would like to see in the handbook as well. If you have a question about something, chances are that another club or council has the same question and maybe someone has something helpful to share. The channel for that input is back through the membership VPs at the councils and then it'll flow to us from there. Um, we did not wanna leave you today with just a high level view. We also wanna provide you with some tactical steps you can implement immediately. So Barry is gonna walk you through those now. Thanks, Kate. Um, as any of you have seen the uh, actual document of the membership plan, it covers a lot of waterfront. And one of the things that we're working on is trying to get from the point where we have a broad vision of lots of things that we need to do down to the point where we're really recommending tactical steps. And that's what this next part is. Uh, I'm gonna run through some items on here and there is also a follow on document that will be coming out uh, hopefully within the next week that will really take this uh, in a much more uh, uh, comprehensive manner to um, present to people in councils and clubs what they can start working on right now. So uh, to look at what we'd like for the councils to start looking at, there's a, we'd like for you to build a life cycle communications plan from the council to the membership. And I break that into three parts. The first one is communicating with new members. Um, we'd like for the councils to send a welcome letter 
introducing the council uh, and talking about the local clubs. Um, there's been some references to people that were in either charter or affiliate clubs, uh, but there's a pretty good percentage and it varies by council, but somewhere between 40 and 60% of our members are not tagged to a local club. Now, part of that is because the previous membership system didn't easy, easily facilitate you identifying that you were a member of a club. We probably knew you were if you were a charter club, but if you were an FFI member in an affiliate club, we might not know that. One of the things that your profile in the uh, system that's being rolled out right now does is allows you to tag yourself to clubs and allows you to tag yourself to multiple clubs. I belong to an affiliate and a charter club. And in the past, I could only identify with one of those. With the new system, uh, there's at least three slots and there may be more than that for those of you that belong to multiple clubs out there. But we want the councils to especially look at those people that are coming in as new members and are not tagged to a club. We want them to provide information on the local clubs and their geography to make sure that we get them into a club. Kate mentioned that the survey showed us that if you're in a club, you have a higher propensity to renew your membership. So we really want to try to drive that membership into the clubs for all of our members. Um, we also want the councils to build a process for retaining existing members. And there is uh, a process that the headquarters staff does when your membership comes up for renewal and they send out a series of emails to you. But one of the things the survey showed us is the importance of that local contact. And so one of the things that we wanna do is make sure that the members are getting information from their local council and clubs when it comes up to time for renewal because will increase the chances of them actually renewing their membership. We wanna take a look at sending out information on a regular basis of what's new with going on with FFI. We have so many new programs that are coming online and exciting new things that are happening. We need to make sure that we uh, have a drumbeat going out to our existing members. Um, the other thing that uh, is going on with the advent of COVID is many of our councils and clubs are doing things virtually. Uh, one of the things we need to do a better job of is taking those people that are not in clubs right now and inviting them to events that the councils and clubs are doing via Zoom or other virtual mechanisms. And that will give us again that tie in point. Um, Rick talked about the industry partner program. This is a great vehicle for our clubs to acquire really superior equipment. And as much as all of us love bidding on 10-year-old uh, waiters, it's really nice to get brand new equipment in there to have in your auctions. And I know that's been a, uh, a large part of the success that we've had in the in the Fort Worth Fly Fishers auctions is we've had great gear in there that we could uh, put in the rod wall, put in the card programs, things like that. So we need to remind everybody about those existing industry partner programs that are there. We also wanted to look at a process for inviting lapsed members back into FFI. Uh, we have good data on people that were past members and we'd like for the councils to periodically go back to those folks, remind them or tell them anew about the value proposition that we have in FFI and invite them back into FFI. Okay, next page. We also want to look at building a social media communications plan. And I know that a lot of councils and clubs already have this in place, but I, it's, it's key to our getting to a different set of demographics uh, of the folks that we want to get out there. If you look at what's going on in the fly fishing industry, it's exploding for women. It's exploding for the millennials and the social media campaigns are the ways to get to those folks. So we really wanna make sure that all the councils and clubs have a comprehensive social media 
plan for getting to them. Um, we also want to look at building a communications plan by reaching out to influencers, those guides, fly shops, bloggers, folks like that that are in your council areas, and reach out to them, build a relationship with them, make sure they understand the value proposition of FFI, and start partnering with them so that they'll start also partnering with us in telling their folks that they have touch points with about FFI. Uh, we also want to look at a, a communications plan to work with affiliate clubs. Uh, I noticed in the QA there were some questions on affiliate clubs, and apparently uh, it had said that all the affiliate clubs had to be FFI members. That is not correct. Uh, charter clubs are by definition all FFI members, but with affiliate clubs, uh, they do not have to be FFI members. However, we, from our perspective, want to look at those folks that are in affiliate clubs and are not yet FFI members, and we want to communicate with them, making sure they understand the value proposition of FFI, because we already know they're fly fishers, we already know they're engaged with a club, and so they're a target-rich environment for us in looking at new members for FFI. And there's some specific things that we're going to be doing and looking at with communications with those affiliate clubs, trying to get the FFI message out to their non-FFI members. Next page, please, Kate. We also wanna look at a, a plan to drive inclusion in the other groups. Uh, survey data shows this, that if you belong to Women's Connect or fly tying group, conservation group, other groups, you're much higher chance of renewing your membership. And so one of the things that we also want to be doing from the council and club level is advertising those groups and suggesting that our FFI members get involved and become participants in those other groups. Um, we also want to uh, really stress getting into your membership that Kate talked about and populating your membership. Once you do the, your profiles in there, once you do that, we have a much better picture of you as a fly fisher, what your desires are, what clubs you're affiliated with and things like that. And we're going to be able to do a much better job of driving our communications out to you in a much more focused manner. And I, Kate, I think that's the last one. Okay, so, um, Kate mentioned that tonight was kind of our first foray into rolling the membership plan out in a, in a public forum, if you will. There is a whole drumbeat of other things that are gonna follow on to this. We're going to do a more in-depth session via Zoom uh, in, the, in the next coming month or so with more details about the actual elements in the membership plan. They're working right now on the toolkits that we were talking about, and all of the material that we're using will ultimately roll into these toolkits for clubs and for councils. Um, one of the first things that's coming is a nice document around these next steps that will flesh them out much better and give you more details things like how to access uh, sample welcome letters and things like that. But we, we have a whole process lined out that we'll be uh, rolling out um, over the next couple of months. So Dutch, let me stop at that point and- uh, Okay, Gary, uh, on that last point you made, um, uh, the toolkits and a lot of the information that'll be included there, uh, we had a question about uh, do you recommend clubs have a new member packet? And if so, what is in it? Well, it sounds like a lot of the information coming forward soon in the toolkit is good, good information for the me new member packet. Yeah, and uh, we certainly do recommend that. And it's going to be information about, you know, the activities of the club, where how the club meets, where it meets, how to get involved in outings, probably the organizational structure of the club so they understand that. So there's a, a ton of information there and that will be part of some of the toolkits we're looking at rolling out. Okay, very, very good. 
Well, Barry, if you can go ahead and stop screen. Uh, it's Kate's. Kate's, OK. Yep, there you go. Then, um, OK. Um, with that, that concludes the three presentations for the 2020 Leadership Development Workshop. Um, there's just been a wealth of information available in three different topics that have been featured tonight. Uh, so in conclusion here, first I want to thank the Council President's Committee uh, for providing feedback on topics that are of genuine interest to them to help us identify the things that we can incorporate into the Leadership Development Workshop. Uh, I want to thank uh, the, the FFI staff for all of their assistance in uh, making all of the things possible that are necessary for this kind of an event. But in particular, I want to thank uh, Steve and Rick, Kate and Barry uh, for, the, for the time you've spent to prepare this information in a form that is very easy for people to see and understand, but to help them at the council and club level, level in relation to the leadership responsibilities that they've had. You've made a difference tonight in a lot of people's lives that have those kinds of responsibilities. So uh, I want to thank you all very much, very, very heartfelt thank you uh, to all of you for what you did to create your presentations this evening. And finally, I want to thank everybody for attending this evening. We've had a wonderful atten attendance, a uh, great group of participants, and uh, thank you so much uh, for joining in and, and on this web on the uh, workshop this evening. And with that, we'll say good evening, be safe, and uh, take care.